Hi, today I want to talk about two other ways that we can use probabilities to try to figure out what expected phenotypes we'll see from a specific Mendelian cross. So I want to look today at a tri-hybrid cross where we have three genetic loci that are unlinked that we're looking at. And also I want to look at epistasis. And we're going to look at the Labrador coat color example for this one. So let's start out with this tri-hybrid cross. And we're going to start out with our two true breeding strains. We're going to make a generation of F1s. And our F1s are going to be heterozygous at the P locus, heterozygous at the Y locus, and heterozygous at the R locus. So we're going to do a self-cross of these. And you can imagine that our Punnett square is going to get pretty cumbersome for this. And so we really don't want to rely on making a Punnett square to figure out the phenotypic ratios of the progeny here. So I want to just start out with thinking about one particular class of progeny and then another class of progeny that is a little bit broader. So first let's think about this one specific class of progeny. And I want to know about progeny that have white flowers, yellow, round seed coats. Okay. So the genotypes of these individuals are going to be little p, little p, big Y, something, big R, something. So instead of drawing out all of the gametes for this, we're just going to go ahead and calculate the probabilities of each of these three loci having uh, those alleles and then multiply them together because this is an and situation where we have to get uh, two little p's and at least one big y and at least one big r so this is an and situation just like before so we're going to first figure out the probability of getting two little p's and if we can always draw this little Punnett square if we want to. Now this time I'm just going to do a generalized Punnett square because I'm not going to draw three. That doesn't make any sense for this situation here. So if our original parents, or these F1s up here, if they're heterozygous at every locus, that means I can treat the probabilities of the loci all about the same. And so I'm just going to call this A. So they can have a big A or a little A in their egg and the sperm are going to either be little a or big A. And I'm going to get this really familiar looking Punnett square that's going to have two ways to get a heterozygote and one way to get a dominant homozygote and one way to get a recessive homozygote. So if I want the probability of having little p, little p, that's going to be the same as the probability of having little a, little a, and that's one fourth. Now the probability of having big Y something, that's going to be one, two, three, so three-fourths. And the probability of big R something will be the same, three-fourths. So I can multiply all of these together. I'm going to get one times three times three, so nine and then 4 times 4 times 4, so 64. So out of the 64 possible gametic combinations, nine of them will give me a plant with these phenotypic traits. So I want to go one step further and think about a situation where I just want to know the probability of getting exactly two recessive traits on a plant. And so phenotypically, there are several ways we could see this. We could have a, um, a purple, yellow, sorry, <laughs> a purple, green, wrinkled plant, a white, yellow, wrinkled plant, or a white, green, round plant. Okay, so I'm going to write those out as the genotypes. That would be two recessive traits. So we can have big P, 
So this is going to be our dominant trait that we see in that plant. And our two recessives will be at the yellow and round loci. We can also get two little peas to get a white flower, and then a yellow seed and a wrinkled seed coat. Or we could get a white flower with a green seed coat, with a green seed and a round seed coat. So these are the three different ways that we can get two recessive traits. So since there are three ways to do this, and these three ways are mutually exclusive, meaning that one plant can only show one of these. You can't have both of the, you can't have two of these or three of these in a single plant. So we say that these are mutually exclusive. So we can get this in three different ways. This is, this is gonna be or. We can have a plant that looks like this, or a plant that looks like this, or a plant that looks like this. So in that case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate each of these probabilities, this one, this one, and this one, and then we're gonna add them together. So let's calculate this first probability, the probability of having a big P something, two little Y's and two little R's. So we already mostly did this above, and we can use that same Punnett square to think about this. To get that one big P, the probability will be 3 fourths. Two little R, two little Y's, sorry, two little Y's first, probability is 1 fourth. And two little R's, probability of 1 fourth. And so our overall probability will be 3 64ths. We can do the same thing for the next one. Probability of two little p's is 1 4th. The probability of one big y at least, or two big y's, is 3 4ths. And the probability of two little r's is 1 4th. Again, since all of these things have to happen to get this genotype, this is an AND statement, and so we're going to multiply these together. So we get the same number, 3 64ths out. And finally, this last one, you can probably guess by now what we're going to get, but I want to go through it anyways. Probability of getting two little p's is 1 4th. The probability of getting two little y's is 1 4th. And the probability of getting one big R, at least, or two big R's, is 3 4ths. And so this gives us 3 64ths as well. So now since we can get this genotype or this genotype or this genotype to satisfy our requirement of having two recessive traits, we're going to add these up together. And that's going to equal to 9 64ths. So that's going to be our probability of having exactly two recessive traits. And you can calculate a bunch of other kinds of really fun probabilities just using these really simple methods. So I want to do one more extension using these probabilities. And I want to look at an epistasis example. So remember for epistasis, whoops, pen slipped. For epistasis, we're talking about a situation where two gene products interact to, um, to modify one trait. So in this case, I want to look at Labrador dog coat color. Dogs are pretty awesome, and I like different color dogs, so that's why I like to do this example. So when we're thinking about Labrador coat color, we see three different colors of Labradors that are common. We see the chocolate Labrador, which we're just going to call brown because we're not fancy. We see a black lab, so black coat colors, and then we see yellow labs, or golden. We're just going to call them yellow. So these are the three common colors that we see in Labrador retrievers, and these are ruled by two different genetic loci. And we talked about these in rats or mice in class, and it's the same kind of idea in, um, in dogs. So there is the E locus, and this is involved in pigment deposition. This is actually a receptor 
but you need it to deposit pigment into the hairs. And then there's also the bee locus. And this is going to determine whether you're going to make brown pigment or black pig pigment. So these Labradors, of course, they have these two loci, and so they are subject to normal Mendelian inheritance rules. These are unlinked loci. And so we can think about these crosses. We're going to just think about our normal cross of our doubly heterozygous individual. And now we can't self-cross a Labrador, but we can cross two individuals with the same genotype. So if we're looking at a cross like this, we expect to see these phenotypic ratios that are normal, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. But in this case, the actual phenotype we see, there aren't two different characters we're looking at. We're looking at a single character, coat color. And so we don't expect to see four different classes of progeny. We know that we're going to see three different classes of progeny. So let's see what's going on here. This 9 here, this refers to individuals that are e, big E something, big B something. This three here refers to individuals that are little e, little e, big B something. This three here is for individuals that are big E something, little b, little b. And this one is for these doubly recessive individuals, doubly homozygous recessive individuals, little e, little e, little b, little b. So let's think about the different kinds of phenotypes that we're actually going to get from these. So these individuals here with one copy of big E and one copy of big B, they'll be able to undergo pigment deposition and they're going to have the dominant form of the pigment. Well, the dominant form of the pigment is going to be black. If you have two little Bs, you're going to make brown pigment. So these individuals will make black pigment and they will deposit the pigment. These individuals here are going to make black pigment, but they've got the recessive version, the loss of function version of the little e locus, or the e locus, so they will not deposit this pigment, and they're going to end up looking yellow since they do not have pigment deposition. These individuals here are little b, little b, so they're going to make the brown pigment, and they have at least one copy of big B, big E, so they will undergo pigment deposition. And then finally, these individuals here are also going to make brown pigment, but they are not going to have pigment deposition, and so they're going to appear to be yellow. So when we look at the different kinds of phenotypic ratios we see, we see that two of these groups, this three and this one, exhibit the same phenotype. They both look yellow. And so that's why we only have three classes of phenotype here in this epistasis uh, relationship. And so when we look at this, we end up seeing that we see three brown individuals, nine black individuals, and four, three plus one, yellow individuals.